exercise clause to the Constitution is found in the very First Amendment. It wasn't originally the First Amendment, but it's the First Amendment now, and so it's the first thing folks see when they look at the, uh, the, the Bill of Rights. It's also in the very first sentence of the First Amendment, uh, which reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Now, there are two parts to that clause uh, that I read. Uh, there's the, what we call the Establishment Clause part, and that's the, the beginning. Uh, Congress shall make no law uh, respecting the establishment of religion. Uh, and then there's the Free Exercise Clause, which follows, which is for prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And that's the part that I want to talk about now, that free exercise part. We're going to start by uh, reminding ourselves of the circumstances under which the country was settled from a religious standpoint. Um, and, and this is certainly a, a part of our, our national lore, uh, and there's, and there's uh, a fair bit of truth to it. Uh, England, during the colonial era in the 17th century uh, and earlier, was a bit of a religious battleground. Uh, you'll all remember Henry VIII, of course, and his many wives, uh, some of whom fared better than others. Uh, Henry uh, separates from the Church of Rome, becomes head of the Church of England, and establishes uh, the what became known in, in England as the Anglican Church. In the United States, it's the Episcopal Church uh, of the United States, and it, it has similar names throughout the world. Uh, it's, uh, it's a church uh, that's politicized in the sense that the, the crown, uh, as the head of state, is also the head of the church, and the church hierarchy participate in the legislative branch. The bishops of the Anglican Church in England uh, have seats in the House of Lords. I once went and sat in on the House of Lords uh, with uh, an American friend who didn't realize this, who got all worked up at, what is, what is church people doing there? Uh, because it seems so alien to us, and that's partly in consequence of the First Amendment. The idea that there would be secured seats for an established religious body in the, the upper house of the national legislature is, is uh, surprising, uh, to say the least, to us. Well, not everybody wanted to belong to the Church of England. Uh, there remained uh, and remain uh, Roman Catholics uh, in England uh, during the whole of this period, uh, forced underground uh, to worship, barred from holding public office and military commissions and the like. Uh, there's a political struggle about, about their rights, uh, but there are also uh, Protestants who think that the reforms of the Church of England didn't go far enough. Uh, there's a group broadly called nonconformists, folks who, uh, who declined to conform. Uh, the struggle over their rights uh, will have a lot of constitutional implications for us. One, uh, I might note, uh, just by way of aside, uh, there was a, a, a procedure whereby a nonconformist could be forced to confess his nonconformity. Yes, I really don't believe uh, what I'm supposed to believe. It was a procedure called the, ex, uh, the oath ex officio, uh, and uh, when the framers uh, got together in Philadelphia, they decided we don't want that to happen here, so they created the uh, right against self-incrimination and threw that into the Fifth Amendment. Uh, which is, appears to have been, in, in part, uh, at least, uh, a response to, the, uh, to that religious um, oath that folks were forced to swear. The, uh, the nonconformists uh, end up becoming lots of different faiths. The Methodists uh, are a spinoff from the uh, official Church of England. Uh, the troublesome Presbyterians in Scotland, of course, uh, have their own thing going. Uh, but there are the, the Baptists, there are all of the various uh, religious denominations that we see in this country, uh, and the Roman Catholics, the, the Christian religious denominations, uh, are, are many of them, except for the Catholics, are, sp are spinoffs from the uh, established Church of England. Uh, and remember also, uh, as I mentioned, all this is happening during the colonial period. So lots of these groups came over. The pilgrims are a good illustration, and that's part of our national lore, that the pilgrims came over in search of religious freedom to build a city on the hill free of the corrupting influences of the politicized Church of England. But the Catholics got a colony. The Maryland colony was founded uh, by a Roman Catholic as a, as a protected haven for, uh, for adherents of the Roman Catholic faith. Uh, Huguenots from France, this is other countries as well, settle in uh, 
uh, South Carolina, uh, Charleston is, uh, has a huge Huguenot population at this time. Uh, so, so we have this, this heritage of, of religious uh, of disagreement, of radicalism, if you will, uh, of, of revolution against established churches. And when the framers uh, sat down to put the Constitution together, one of the things they decided they needed to do, uh, this appeared in an amendment because it was raised in a number of the ratifying conventions, was to uh, include a provision uh, making it clear that the rights of these various groups were not to be messed with by the new national government that was being established in the Constitution. So Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. If you have your own religious view, we're not going to establish a church. That's the Establishment Clause. You all do whatever it is that you want to do. And that sounds fairly straightforward and simple. Now, of course, nothing is that simple over time. Uh, you can't conceive of every uh, scenario that's going to uh, come up in the, spirit, the period of several hundred years. And, uh, and so, because the Supreme Court has the power of judicial review, uh, it's not too long before we start seeing challenges to things that Congress has done, and then later things that the states have done once it's determined by the Supreme Court that the states are also subject to the Free Exercise Clause, that arguably interfere with or prohibit the free exercise of religion. Uh, now, in, there's certainly uh, and sadly not enough time exhaustively to treat this topic, but I want to hit the high points so you see where we, where we were, uh, where we came to be, and where we and where we are now as far as Supreme Court case law uh, is concerned. Um, the 1960s uh, is where we're going to start. Uh, a woman uh, named Adele Sherbert, who uh, is uh, an employee at a textile uh, plant, uh, a couple of years into her job, she converts to the Seventh-day Adventist faith, uh, which is a Sabbatarian faith, meaning that the holy day is Saturday. And, uh, and that goes well until her employer decides to move from a five to a six day work week. And now she's expected to work on Saturdays as well, which she can't do in good conscience because that's her religion's day of reflection, prayer, rest, etc. So she, she refuses and she's fired. Uh, that's not the constitutional problem. Uh, the constitutional problem arises when she goes to get unemployment compensation and she's denied by the state on the grounds that she was fired. But she was fired because she was trying to protect her right to uh, freely uh, exercise her religious beliefs. And that's what gives rise to a Supreme Court case. The case of Sherbert uh, versus Werner, the Supreme Court decides it in 1963, and they adopt uh, what was for a long time the standard of review in these free exercise cases. What the Supreme Court said was free exercise is really important, the free exercise right. And it shouldn't be possible for a state, for the federal government, to substantially burden that right to freely exercise religion unless it's got a really good reason for doing so. So the reason for substantially burdening the religious practice, if it's going to be constitutional, has to be compelling. That's a pretty hard standard to meet. It's a standard that uh, we refer to in this and other areas of constitutional law as the strict scrutiny standard. And it's the toughest standard there is. It's what we use for race discrimination cases. So uh, if you have a religious practice that's substantially burdened by something that the government has done under the Sherbert test, the, the government regulation uh, is unconstitutional uh, unless unless it's been done for a compelling reason. And as I say, that's fairly, fairly hard to satisfy. Now, the Sherbert test was the dominant test uh, in free exercise cases until 1990, when uh, the Supreme Court got another major free exercise case. Uh, it's a case of, of a couple guys uh, who uh, were members of the Native American church, Alfred Smith and Galen Black, and they worked at a, a drug rehab center. Now, the Native American church, uh, as you may know, has as its central ceremonial uh, ritual the ingestion of peyote, which is a prescribed uh, substance under federal drug control laws. And uh, 
not surprisingly, uh, when it became known to the employers of these two guys uh, that they had been ingesting a federally controlled substance uh, as in, while employees at a drug uh, rehab center, uh, they lost their jobs. Uh, and so we had sort of a revisitation of the Sherbert circumstances. They were attempting to exercise their religious uh, beliefs, uh, exercise religious practice, uh, and, uh, and they suffered uh, as, a result, uh, as a result of it. Uh, and uh, again, by the public sector, because this, this became the Sherbert, the Sherbert case. It wasn't a firing, or maybe it was. I, don't, I frankly can't remember. The, uh, so the Sherbert um, uh, test, one would have thought, would have applied. Uh, but the Supreme Court said, uh, I don't know if we want to do that anymore. Justice Scalia wrote the majority opinion. And what he said was, um, you know, in a way, this, this, is, this is different because it's a, it's a criminal act that has, you know, sort of led to the firing here. Um, but, but that's not going to affect the new general rule that we're going to adopt. Uh, and the general rule seems to have been driven by interests of efficiency um, because uh, the Sherbert rule is rather tough on legislatures. Uh, there's a whole lot of religious groups out there, the whole lot of different religious practices, and you pass a law without even being aware of them if you interfere with mandatory school attendance, uh, transfusion requirements at hospitals for accident victims who come in. People have different views about these things grounded in religion. Uh, and the Sherbert test essentially made it hard for the federal government to, or the state governments to in, interfere with or infringe upon any of those groups. Uh, again, groups about which it might, the government might not even be, uh, be aware. So Justice Scalia said, um, we're gonna do something different from now on. And the new rule is that unless the statute is targeting a religious practice, uh, if, it's, uh, if it's simply a, a statute of, a neutral statute of general applicability, nobody can ingest peyote, for instance, or uh, if, uh, returning to the Sherbert facts maybe, uh, if, you, you know, if you're going to uh, receive unemployment compensations, you can't have been fired. Um, but so it's a statute of general neutral applicability, not targeting a particular re religious group. Then all the government has to show in order for it to be upheld as constitutional, is that it's, it's rational, that it's, that it's rationally related to a legitimate end of government. And that's a much easier standard to satisfy. So, so that's the new test, 1990 in the Employment Division versus Smith case. Now, that's great news for governments, not so great for religious groups. And there was an immediate political response to that. Uh, groups organized disparate religious communities. The uh, Roman Catholic Church sat down with the Scientologists, uh, Muslims, uh, Jews, various Christian denominations, started lobbying uh, Congress for some form of legislative fix, and Congress responded with a statute uh, called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, uh, passed in 1993 and signed by President Clinton, the vote was extraordinary. It was passed unanimously in the House of Representatives and with only three no votes in the Senate, 97 yes votes. We don't work that way anymore, but that's how we worked in 1993. The legislature did on this issue. And what the Religious Freedom Restoration Act did, in effect, was to say, you know, uh, what the Supreme Court just said in that Smith case, not, not law anymore. Uh, we think that the standard ought to be the Sherbert test. We think that before federal or state governments should be allowed to burden religious practices, they ought to be required to prove that they have a compelling reason for doing so. And so RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, became the law. Now, it won't surprise you to know that it wasn't long before that law got challenged as unconstitutional. And it, and it probably won't surprise you to learn how the Supreme Court came out on that. RIFRA was essentially a federal legislative uh, wrist slapping. Uh, that's the, the Congress telling the court, no, this isn't the standard you're going to apply in free exercise cases. Uh, in the case of City of Bernie versus Flores, which was decided in 1997, uh, the uh, Supreme Court uh, was uh, invited to opine on the constitutionality of that portion of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act that told states what to do. 
that told states that the level of review uh, in cases in which they were alleged to have violated free exercise rights was going to be strict scrutiny, that they, the states, would have to come up with a compelling end. City of Bernie de de denied a, a zoning permit to a local Catholic church which wanted to build a, an addition uh, it denied it on the grounds that it was in a historic uh, district and the, the addition plans didn't seem to match the, the look of the rest of the district. Um, the church said, well, you, you can't do that because it's free exercise, right? We need this for our worship uh, unless you show a compelling end. City of Bernie said, no, no, uh, 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 because that's what the Religious Freedom Restoration Act says. Uh, City of Bernie says, yeah, but the Employment Division versus Smith case says we just need a rational reason, a rational uh, uh, relationship to a legitimate end, and it's the historic district, et cetera, uh, because RIFRA is unconstitutional as applies to states. Supreme Court got that case and decided that City of Bernie was right. That in fact, Congress can't tell the Supreme Court how to decide free exercise cases, uh, at least as applied to states, that Congress doesn't have that power. Uh, under the Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, which was its basis for passing the statute. So suddenly RIFRA became bifurcated. The federal government was still subject to it and is still subject to it. So if Congress is going to pass a statute that substantially burdens a religious practice, then it's supposed to show a compelling end for doing so. But states were rendered free now to pass neutral statutes of general applicability that that burdened religious practices incidentally, uh, and for the practice to be constitutional under the Free Exercise Clause, all they had to show was that the statute was essentially rationally related to a legitimate end. Now, there was a legislative response to that, too. But it wasn't a federal legislative response, because Congress is no longer of any value. It was a state legislative response, and the same coalition of forces gathered and started working state legislatures. Uh, and what the states were urged to do was to adopt state RIFRAs, which is to say state statutes or constitutional amendments providing that if, if our state does something that interferes with the free exercise of religion, then we assume to ourselves a strict scrutiny burden, that we will have to prove a compelling end before, uh, before under our state laws or state constitution, that imposition will be valid. Uh, about half of the states at this point have adopted state RIFRA statutes or, con or constitutional provisions or their existing constitutional provisions have been interpreted by state courts to require that strict scrutiny be met before uh, infringement is, uh, is constitutionally permissible or burden on free exercise is constitutionally permissible. And about half, half the states haven't uh, adopted those statutes or had those constitutional provisions inserted or so interpreted. Uh, so in those states, the non-state RIFRA states, the level of review is rational basis. And it's easier for the state to pass general application legislation that does burden the free exercise of religion. That's where we stand now. Now, I want to make one closing sort of larger point, um, which I think is important. Uh, remember, the Free Exercise Clause wasn't put into the Constitution to protect a majority state-sponsored religion. Majority religion doesn't need the Free Exercise Clause because in a democracy, the majority controls the legislature. So if the majority all support one religious view, the assumption is that the majority will not interfere with their own free exercise rights. They won't pass legislation at the state level or the federal level that would interfere with their rights to practice their religion. They know what those, what those practices are. They're going to be watching legislation to see if it would interfere with them. No, it's all the other folks whose rights are protected by the Free Exercise Clause. And when we make it harder for legislatures to pass laws that incidentally burden religious practices about which they might be completely unaware, then we reinforce our recognition of the importance of those minority religious rights. Uh, it's a concession to our heritage as the descendants, political descendants, of members of minority religions. So that when a state legislature, uh, for instance, the legislature of Oklahoma, which is a state RIFRA state, uh, or Texas, which is a state RIFRA state, actually assumes that RIFRA burden, 
our legislation will be invalid if it interferes with your religious freedom rights. What they're, they're your free exercise rights. What they're doing isn't protecting the majority religion, although it does that incidentally. But what it's but what it's really doing is protecting those minority religions, uh, which include Judaism, Islam, Scientology, uh, and a whole host of religions of which most of us have probably never heard. Uh, that's the heritage uh, that's enshrined in these uh, state RIFRA statutes. Uh, and and it's, it's part of our legacy, I believe, as uh, the political descendants of uh, immigrating nonconformists. Thank you. Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu.